viewers, thanks for watching my show. My show gives the pageant community the opportunity to get to know title holders. Before we begin, I wanted to ask that you click the red subscribe button and also click the notifications bell so you can be aware of every time I post a video. I wanted to thank all of my sponsors, everyone who's donated to my show, um, Donna Ward, Sandra Gray, Renee Brown, Thomas May, Scott Benton, and Stanley Taylor. Uh, my guest today is Miss America 2002, Katie Harmon Ebner. Katie, thank you so much for being on my show today. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Hi, Jason. Hi, it's such a pleasure to have you. Um, oh, thank you. Great to be with you. Yeah, when I advertised that I was interviewing you, the pageant community had a great response to it. Um, oh. Vincent Bishop said, I love her. Tiak Eastman said, can't wait. Such a sweetheart. Jackie Jenkins said, love her. And Preston Larson said, one of my favorite Miss Americas. Oh, so sweet. That's very kind. I appreciate it. Right. So uh, could you tell us about your background and how you got involved in pageants? Yes, absolutely. I, like many of the contestants that have gone through this program, pursued the program first and foremost for the scholarship dollars. And I'm not unusual in being one of those young women that <laughs> really, really needed those scholarship dollars. Right. I entered the program as a freshman in college. At the time, I was at the University of Puget Sound okay. studying biology with a minor in music. And I quickly discovered that my biology career was uh, was going to be short lived. Right. I enjoyed music and performance um, so much more right. in that that is what really filled my soul. Mm -hmm. And at that age, when you're the ripe old age of what I was 18, newly 19, right. um, you're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out what the world is around you. And mm -hmm. that was a perfect opportunity for me to, to dive into the Miss America program while I was still trying to discover who I was right. and the organization. And of course, the, the scholarship assistance that I earned through participation in the program mm -hmm. helped me to, to better understand mm -hmm. that which I wanted to give to the world right. and therefore better understand who I was. And so uh, after that first pageant that I competed in, the Miss Multnomah County Scholarship Program mm -hmm. in Oregon, this is just outside of Portland, the uh, county of Multnomah County is the largest county in Oregon, okay. but it was an, an open pageant. Okay. So anyone from the outlying areas of uh, surrounding Portland could compete. Right. And I had never participated in a pageant, but I had done so much theater up to that point, oh, which okay. really prepared me for being on stage. Mm -hmm. So it, I, even though I didn't know the ins and outs of the pageant world, right. I was able to kind of associate what I had learned in theater with what I was being right. trained to do in the pageants mm -hmm. and uh, quickly loved it. Okay. Fell in love with the program. <laughs> Absolutely fell in love with it. Right. Um, I was um, crowned to my complete surprise, oh. crowned Miss Multnomah County, uh, that very first pageant, and then was first runner up at the Miss Oregon program that oh, cool. summer. And th at, through that opportunity of being first runner up, I was then able to compete at the National Sweetheart Pageant. Oh, okay. And I'm sure you've heard this before, Jason, from a number of contestants who have had the great fortune of being able to compete at the Sweetheart Pageant, but it truly uh, changed my perspective on how I would continue to compete wow. uh, that next year. Okay. It was a tremendous experience. The people who run the, the National Sweetheart Pageant, uh, the Crabtree family, mm -hmm. um, they welcomed us with open arms. And of course, being given the opportunity to compete against first and second and sometimes third runner-ups mm -hmm. in the program is the closest thing that you're going to get to competing at Miss America. Right. And several of the girls that I competed with at Sweetheart went on to win their state pageants mm -hmm. either the next year or subsequent years right. and uh the sweetheart pageant has seen many of us miss americas go through their program as well right jason i i'm my 
tears are coming here. Aww. It's not from, it's just from tears of seeing how beautiful you are. Uh, for whatever reason, my eyes are a little weepy. So my apologies, <laughs> oh, they'll, they'll quiet down, but they're, my eyes are happy to see you. <laughs> right. I but after competing at Sweetheart, mm -hmm. I went back with renewed uh, vigor and excitement right. and won the Miss Portland uh, local, then went on to win Miss Oregon and then uh, subsequently Miss Oregon. So, or Miss America, excuse me. Right. So this was over about a year and a half worth's time span very quickly. That's really cool that you pointed out that the sweetheart pageant kind of, it benefited your journey. Um, oh, absolutely. I think the Miss America organization tried to get people to not really compete in sweetheart anymore mm -hmm. i'm not sure why but um you know maybe somebody will hear this and think that you know it is beneficial that um you know that people do that so experience uh, is beneficial no matter what right that's what i tell people in my career as well is if you want to become proficient mm -hmm. in whatever it is that you're choosing to do gain experience there's no better teacher and the national sweetheart pageant was a top notch experience right. to prepare me for competing at Miss America. Very cool. Okay, so I have the video of your crowning moment when you were crowned oh Miss goodness. America. I want to watch <laughs> the video and then I want to ask you um what were you thinking or how and what were you feeling in that moment? Okay. Okay, so here's the crowning moment of Miss America 2002 Katie Harmon Ebner. That leaves Miss Massachusetts and Miss Oregon one of you will win a $40,000 scholarship to continue your education. The other will win a $50,000 scholarship, the crown, the title, and the job of Miss America 2002. Ladies, hold tight. The first runner-up and winner of a $40,000 scholarship, Miss Massachusetts Abbey Day Playboy. Miss America 2002 is Miss Oregon, Katie Harmon. Are you going to go to Disneyland? You betcha! Congratulations. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Al America's waiting. The runway is yours, Katie. So I love your crowning moment. Um, do you remember what you were thinking and feeling in that moment? Oh, absolutely. Many Miss Americas and many title holders have described that moment as kind of being an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I didn't really understand what that meant, but I vividly recall standing on that stage, looking out at the audience. Mm -hmm. And of course this was a very newly post 9-11 America right. as well. And so the patriotism in that audience was at an all time high. So people were thrilled to be there. So I remember looking out at that, mm -hmm. thinking, first of all, this is surreal being in this moment in general. Right. And I'd love to share with you the story about how we even got to be on the stage at that time. It yeah. almost didn't happen. The pageant almost didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But when I was standing there looking out, I thought, this cannot be real. This has <laughs> got to be a dream. This is this is not my life right, right now. Oh, wait a minute. It is my life. And I do remember snapping too and thinking, oh my gosh, uh, whatever happens next, I need to be in the moment. Right. Um, one of my theater directors uh, had told me before that, uh, Katie, if you don't stay in the moment of your performance, uh -huh. then you will look back and not remember the joy and the excitement and just the beauty of being on stage. Right. And I have never forgotten that because wow. it really, really helped me to, to not only, of course, remember the experience, mm -hmm. which is very important, but to find immense joy in that moment, right. regardless of whatever the outcome would have been. Wow, and very interesting. So, I, it, I, yeah, I was stunned, as you can clearly see, Jason. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Being a, the, the first Oregonian woman, of course, not right. to have been in that position. Okay. We have had first runner-ups before, but uh, to have won, 
I was so proud for my state. Yes. I was so proud for my family. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, what in the world have I just done? Right. <laughs> what have I, what, what's happening next? The world is so different now. What yeah. is, what am I going to be walking into? Um, in a post 9-11 America. Right. I, I think I remember when I watched your crowning moment, you kind of like pointed to the Oregon people like, oh, my God, you oh, know, like, yes. yeah, so it must have been amazing. It was a small but mighty group. <laughs> right. So um, back to the 9-11, how was it competing after 9-11? Or can you talk about the events leading up to the actual pageant that week? Oh, absolutely. And this is really pivotal, pivotal in Miss America history, in addition to pop culture history. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really a fascinating uh, story, as well as a, for me to recall it. Right. Um, it's vividly burned in my memory as well. So 9-11 was slated to be our first day of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. You can imagine 51 of us walking into Boardwalk Hall the day before oh on yeah. Monday the 10th with all of the, the ceremony and the pomp and the circumstance that um, had heralded in contestants past. Um, we had the exact same experience. We're 51 young women thinking our lives are going to be changed. We have our game faces on. Uh, we're ready to be Miss America. Yeah. So the morning of 9-11, we were dispersed throughout Boardwalk Hall as well as throughout our hotels, um, waiting for the various times that we were assigned to come in and rehearse. Mm -hmm. My group, the Alpha group, was um, was scheduled to be there first. So we were in Boardwalk Hall about 7.30 in the morning. We were meeting with the costume designers for our production number with Tony Danza. Mm -hmm. We were touring the stage. We were taking in the experience essentially, and then waiting for the, the next groups to arrive right. to then start our, our subsequent other rehearsals. When the first tower was hit, our security guard that was posted just outside of our dressing room mm -hmm. ran into the dressing room and announced that there had been um, an attack wow. on one of the buildings in New York City. Mm -hmm. We didn't know which building. We, For me, who had never been to New York City, I had no idea what she was talking about. Okay. Um, and I think that was the same for about half of us in, in the room, being from all areas of the United States right. and all varied backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, the rest of like our next group of contestants, um, I think it was the Mew group arrived. They had been privy to seeing, watching oh. some of the, the footage back in their hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. And so they knew, they, they arrived with really sullen expressions, uh, tear-stained faces, mm -hmm. worry, mm -hmm. which then really impacted those of us who had no idea what was going on. And at this time, this was a pre-cell phone era, oh, which is yeah, hard for right. me to say right now, Jason, that dates me. <laughs> <laughs> but pre-cell phone era. So we had no contact with the outside world, truly. And I do remember uh, Miss Alaska Eugenia Premis digging around to find a an AM FM radio mm -hmm. in the back closet of our dressing room. And she tuned it just in time for us to hear Peter Jennings announce that the second tower had been hit. Yeah. And when we listened to him, it was so sobering. That's when it started to sink in what was happening just across the way from us, right? Two hours right. from where we were. Once all of the contestants were assembled, the Miss America organization basically gathered us up and took us into a secure room. Mm -hmm. And along with uh, the executives from ABC announced to us that there probably would not be a Miss America pageant. Oh. They had no idea what to do as this historic pop culture icon, an mm -hmm. American icon. And at that time, as you know, there were, there were different uh, twitterings throughout media that this could be an attack. Yeah. That there that the the nation was under terrorism. attack. Yeah. Yes, terrorism. And so at the at the prospect of that and holding this iconic pageant just 2 hours from where the the twin towers had been hit, um 
the executives were understandably worried. Nobody knew what was happening at mm -hmm. that time. So with that news, of course, you have 51 young women who are scattered from throughout the nation um, without contact to, with friends and family, yeah. without really truly knowing what was going on as well. So you can imagine, uh, while it was not chaotic at all, the organization had us very, very well, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say controlled, but they really had uh, this nice loving wrap on mm -hmm. us. They were concerned for us. They didn't want any harm to come to us. And I really appreciate that. But we were contained. Right. There was nowhere for us to go. Oh. And now we're thinking, okay, so there is so much more important things that are happening than the Miss America pageant. And right. how do I get home? <laughs> yeah. That was that was one of the thoughts. Yeah. Then our thoughts switched because uh, one of uh, the long time tour managers as well as field directors for the Miss America organization, Marie Nichols, just in, uh, within maybe five, 10 minutes of ABC and MAO announcing that the pageant would no longer continue. Mm -hmm. Marie received a phone call. Oh, okay. Her cousin, Victor Saraceni, was one of the pilots <gasps> of, of the planes, of one of the planes that had hit the, the World Trade Center towers. And James, I will tell you, there is no more sobering moment than when you watch with your own eyes and when you hear that moment of grief when someone loses a loved one. Mm -hmm. And Marie has 51 women who love her and adore her and of course a staff that loves her, surrounding her, uh, loving on her, which I'm so grateful for. And she has later recounted too, I would have never, I, I can't imagine being with any other family than my Miss America family. Mm -hmm as I lost my family member. And she had lost her husband uh, just a couple of years before. And Victor was her closest um, closest family member. Wow. And he and his wife had cared for Marie. So she was very, very close with Victor. And um, that is when it hit me, what had happened. Mm -hmm. the, the sobering reality of the fact that our nation would never be the same and that there was such a significant loss of life. Mm -hmm. From that time, there was about a, a 24 hour period where the Miss America organization had to figure out legitimately, what do we do right. with these young women and with our staff and with the pageant and all of the, the trimmings and the trappings that go along with that. Now, what do we do? Mm -hmm. We were sent back to our hotels and then we were reassembled about 24 hours later. And we were asked a pivotal question. I'll tell you, James, I have been in the entertainment industry now for about 20 years professionally. Okay. And I will never encounter a situation again where the producer of a multi-million dollar production comes to me and says, would you like to go to work today? Right. Should we do this production? Yeah. <laughs> that will, I will never have that instance again. Right. It, it doesn't happen. It's unheard of. But MAO and ABC had the forethought, knowing that one of us would be crowned during this time if the, if the pageant were to continue. Right. One of us would be traveling the nation and, in fact, the world, mm -hmm. representing not only the pageant, but America at a very pivotal time. Right. So they, when they assembled us, they asked us, ladies, we want you to decide in a vote amongst the group whether you would like to continue with this program or not. That is what made our class different from anyone who had come before mm -hmm. and anyone who would follow. Right. And we voted two to one in favor of going ahead with the pageant. Okay. It is because of that scenario mm -hmm. that we still have a Miss America pageant today. Wow. I can't imagine if we had not been able to continue continue with the pageant, if the pageant would have been able to, to right. go on for subsequent years. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a big question. It's a very interesting question that the organization has asked in the years to come since as well. Wow. Yeah.
Wow. I I just recounted my own experience um, as you were um, telling the story, and I actually got emotional. I was in college at the mm-hmm. University of Michigan when it happened. I remember I was walking to class, and I saw everybody watching a TV, and I'm like, why is everybody looking at this TV? And I saw what happened, and they canceled class that day, and everybody just felt lost. Like, you know, we didn't know what to do. There were kids trying to call their families in New York, you know, trying to yes. get in touch with people, and they couldn't. And um, I think we just had a candlelight vigil and prayed. And um, it was a very, a very sad time. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we can lighten it up a little bit now. Yes. Um, <laughs> how was it to meet Tony Danza? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tony was, you know, the consummate gentleman, of course. Everything that you would hope Tony Danza would be, he was. He was just a, a professional to the hilt. And of course, a a patriot. And he was delighted, first and foremost, to be hosting the Miss America pageant. Uh It was so exciting for him. And for his co-host to be named Angela. So Angela Baracchio, of course. He walked straight through that open door. He was like, I will never forget it when we were backstage and we were, we could hear what was going on, of course. Right. But while we're backstage changing and getting ready for the, the next phases of competition, all of a sudden I hear, hey, yo, Angela. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, of course, Tony Dance is going to say that. <laughs> right. He was amazing though. The fact that he started the pageant with the Pledge of Allegiance, oh. the fact that he treated us with such immense respect um, I never did get a chance to do that production number with him oh. because I think that it was the top 10. We were changing for a swimwear or something like that. And mm-hmm. I was like, dang it. I missed my chance to perform with Tony Danza. Yeah. <laughs> so next, I would love to talk about talent. Um, you were a talent winner. Is that correct? I was. Right. Yes. So um, Charles O'Quinn said the greatest Miss America talent, period. Jeremy Harrison said, love Katie's opera talent that year. And I love opera also. So uh, I want to uh, watch your talent video and then we can talk about it. Like how old were you when you started singing and why did you choose that song or, you know, that. So here is the talent of Miss America 2002, Katie Harmon Ebner. You put so much emotion into that performance that that's what I love about that performance. So how did you choose that song? How old were you when you started singing? Mm -hmm. I started formal voice lessons at the age of 10. Okay. And I grew up, I was born in Portland, Oregon, but I grew up for the majority of my young childhood in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, cool. And that's where I got my start in theater in little church cantatas and community productions and things like that. And so when we moved back to Portland, 
and I started at a new school. Um, I had a terrific music teacher at my elementary school. Oh. Her name is Jerutha Faberell. And Jerutha was a well-known gospel singer in the area. Mm -hmm. And I every day I could not wait to go to music class with Miss with Miss Faberell. And she inspired me to kind of get out of my dancer uh, frame because at first I was strictly just into ballet. Okay. And that was kind of my first foray into theater too. So my mother put me into ballet classes at the age of five at the um, Charlotte Ballet Academy because I wouldn't sit still. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I can't sit still. I can't, I just have a hard time. So mom knew I'm going to do something to put my daughter in, into some sort of active activity right. like this. So I had always just kind of pictured myself as the dancer and not the singer. My grandfather is a first generation Italian okay. and he would go around singing Italian arias and Italian songs all the time. Um, but I never put it together that that was something that could be passed on to me. Right. <laughs> that I, I might too have that affinity for yeah. opera. And it wasn't until I met Mrs. Faverell that um, I even opened my mouth to try and sing a solo. Mm -hmm. So she gave me a solo in a production of Reading, Writing, and Rockin'. Okay. And this solo set me on the path to wanting to pursue more music. And yes, I was in the fifth grade. And you are never too young to find your passion, mm -hmm. ever. If you know what... If you know that something fills your heart, it doesn't matter how old you are, right. you're going to find it. And that was for me, it was in the fifth grade. And uh, the following year, there was another production. There happened to be a local voice instructor in the audience, Janine Kirstein. And Janine was a, a well-known, well-regarded, beloved voice teacher who uh, had also been a, a high school and middle school choir director. Okay. And she approached my parents after the production and said, I think that Katie has some natural talent. Mm -hmm. I would love to work with her. And my mother remembers saying back to Janine, I didn't know you needed voice lessons to sing. Don't you just open your mouth? <laughs> my parents were not musicians, <laughs> but they loved me and they supported me and they knew that their active theatrical child, um, that this could be something that I really loved and they were right. After that first voice lesson with Janine, I was hooked. Cool. And Janine recognized that I had a voice um, that could be well suited for uh, classical arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for opera, for art song, for for anything classical. And uh, she was right in that I had found my na my niche yeah. essentially in music, my my genre. And my grandparents used to feed me these tapes. You know, they used to subscribe to the Reader's Digest. This You might be too young no, for this, No, I remember. Jason, I remember but, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> but they would subscribe to the Reader's Digest music series. Uh -huh. And they would get these cassette tapes at the time. And then they switched to CDs yeah. of classical music. And they did not like classical music. But they knew that I did. Mm -hmm. And so they would send them to me. And that's what I would listen to. Um, I had no idea who the Backstreet Boys were. I had no <laughs> idea who was popular at that time because I was busy listening to uh, Jesse Norman and uh, Frederica von Stade and yeah. these opera singers at the time that just filled my soul. I was that kid who was just entranced by opera. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I continue to pursue it. I did voice lessons all the way through in uh, high school. Uh, so for 10, I was with Janine for 10 years. Wow. I even studied with her uh, just right, right as I transitioned from my freshman year um, to my sophomore year of college and then um, found my current voice teacher, the teacher that I've been with. So I'm very, very loyal to my voice teachers. <laughs> Jan, uh, Ruth Dobson is my current voice teacher. Mm -hmm. I still see her. And even though I'm teaching now, um, mm -hmm. I believe that a tune-up is always a good thing, right? As your car ages, right. still get the tune-up. <laughs> very cool. You already know this because you judged the Miss America 2010 competition mm -hmm. but um jen corey miss district of columbia 2009 oh. 
Yes. She sang the same song that you did she for talent. Did. And I beautifully. I loved beautifully. it. I loved it. Oh, I love how she sang that song. That's cool. Me I too. love it. Well, Omio Babi No Caro is one of the most famous, well known, and well sung arias in the history of, of uh, opera. Mm-hmm. And there's good reason. Puccini knew what he was doing when he wrote that. Uh, all of his works, of course, but for whatever reason, that particular aria really, really resonates with people, not only because of the character, but the way that it's written, the voicing in uh-huh. it is indicative of this young Laretta who is pleading her father. It's perfectly suited for a soprano. It's perfectly suited for a young voice as mm-hmm. well as any sort of voice, quite frankly, but um, just the cry in it in the voicing is so, so special. And I, uh, Jason, I have sung this piece uh-huh. uh, thousands of time now. Okay. It's, it is something that I is constantly in my repertoire and I am not mad about that. I love I it. Love singing I could listen to you sing it every day. So, <laughs> You're um, so sweet. Can, we, can you talk about your platform and some of the community mm-hmm. service you did, you know, during your year of service as Miss America? Yes. So as you can imagine, my year became two pronged. Yeah. It was I was able to to speak on behalf of and work on behalf of my personal platform issue, which was breast cancer awareness. Mm-hmm. And um, not only was I doing that though, but because of 9-11, I had this the privilege of being able to work with the USO at, for various events for our military and uh, on behalf of first responders. Uh-huh. So I was able to have two platform issues essentially during that year. Mm-hmm. And both um, are issues that I continue to work with to this day. While I was Miss America, not only was I making appearances um, on behalf of the military and, and first responders, mm-hmm. my first appearance was with the USO um, at Ground Zero. Oh. And then the the following week was at the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can imagine that that was um, made a significant impact on me and how, how I viewed my Miss America service throughout that year. Right. Um, I, I really, really took that seriously. And it is what legitimized the experience for me. So in addition to being able to, uh, to appear with uh, the USO, I was um, traveling. You have heard the old adage before, 20,000 miles a month, (laughs) which was absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I have it documented in all of my journals. (laughs) My mother kept all of my schedules and we actually calculated how many miles and sometimes it was more than 20,000. Wow. So traveling the nation though, but I was part of something um, called a a quality healthcare access network Mm -hmm. where I was able to go into every state capital except for Hawaii and Alaska. Oh, the two most beautiful states, right? They're all beautiful, but I didn't get the chance to visit them during that time. But I was in every single state capital throughout that year, Mm -hmm. um, speaking on behalf of breast cancer patients and specifically in regards to comprehensive cancer care Mm -hmm. with those uh, quality healthcare networks. And uh, that took me to uh, labs, that took me to uh, patient bedsides, that took me to uh, legislators' desks. It took me all over the United States in uh, working in a variety of conditions in order to see clearly what cancer patients needed in regards to comprehensive cancer care and and what work was being done. Um, And I genuinely appreciated that perspective. I mean, who else can say that they got a front row to be able to say thank you to first responders and military immediately after 9-11 and to be able to say thank you to the oncologists and professionals and um, medical providers and patients who were at the cutting edge of cancer care at that time. Uh, As a 21 year old, my life was forever changed and I am so grateful. So October was Breast Cancer Awareness Month and my school, I'm a teacher, my school took it very seriously because um, the principal, his mom passed away from breast cancer Mm -hmm. and um, one of the teachers there, um, she was, she had just been diagnosed with breast cancer and she's young and, and, and we learned that it can come 
to anyone at any age we learned that men can get it too so um my school really took that seriously and educated the kids about it and the staff about it so yeah we really learned about breast cancer awareness yeah absolutely it does it touches us all it touches us all my sister-in-law um, is still in the midst of a, a vicious uh, breast cancer battle. And I am so inspired by her strength um, and by what she has done. And, and I am inspired by every single patient, um, every single person who has experienced breast cancer and those who continue to fight on behalf of our loved ones. We're going to find a cure. One of these days, we are going to find a cure. And it's because of the efforts of you, your students, your school, people who right. um, are, are not letting this awareness uh, die off. We have to keep speaking about us. Anything that is important, we have to keep speaking about. Yes. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, the transition to Miss America 2.0. Um, there's mm-hmm. been some changes. Of course, swimsuit, the um, lifestyle and fitness competition was eliminated. Mm-hmm. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, my thoughts about the swimsuit competition, I'll tell you this. Because I was entering the program as a freshman, uh-huh. I my my entire lifestyle basically right was turned upside down i was out of my home for the first time i was on my own um and i was eating and not exercising like i was on my own Mm -hmm. i gained the freshman 15. right and i was studying all the time and i was stressed out um my lifestyle was not conducive as a freshman to um to me being able to live healthily yeah. for the rest of my life but i didn't know that you know you're young i was 18 years old yeah and i'm living like all of my other peers mm-hmm. um and so when i entered the program and started training for that lifestyle and fitness portion of competition, Jason, it changed my life. I had a fantastic trainer who was not, he was really conscientious about making sure to reinforce in my training that this was not about getting skinny. Okay. I was already a, a thin person. Yeah. I, I'm small, I'm petite, I'm five foot three. Um, and I've always been fairly slight. Yeah. So for him, he wanted to make sure to reinforce to me, Katie, this is about you gaining strength and building habits that you can take with you for the rest of your life beyond the swimsuit competition. Mm -hmm. He was always saying that. So in our nutrition training in my nutrition training and in my weight training and and in the routine that he had set up for me, which I had never been exposed to before. I was a young person. I was dancing. I was doing theater. I was eating cheeseburgers and, and and pizza, which I still do, which is wonderful, but (laughs) it was about moderation and about balance. Mm -hmm. And had it not been for that, the lifestyle and fitness competition and really the, the impetus, right? The, Mm -hmm. the motivation to change and to learn more about a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, I would not have the knowledge that I do today. So I highly valued the lifestyle and the fitness competition. I was also an extremely modest person. I still am. Yeah. Um, So getting up on that stage in that red metallic bikini Uh was um, a huge, huge, huge milestone for me for confidence. Okay. It was a, it was a confidence thing. So when I look at that, I did not feel objectified. That was my choice. It was my choice to get up there on that stage mm-hmm. because it was empowering for me to say, hey, I feel good about myself and all of the work that I have done right. to be able to get up here in this swimsuit, one that I would have never worn before mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and enjoy the experience um, for my personal benefit. I was very, very proud of that. My mother was horrified at that swimsuit though. <laughs> I remember my executive director, Dana Phillips, chose that swimsuit. She knew the minute we picked it out in LA, she was like, oh my gosh, that's the swimsuit. Uh-huh. And, but we didn't show it to my parents. We, my parents had no idea what my wardrobe was up until you know, seeing me on stage in Atlantic City. Right. And after I competed in swimwear 
and met my parents at visitation afterwards, my mother ran up to me and said, what was that patriotic band-aid you were wearing? Oh my gosh, <laughs> really? I, what is this? And to this day, it fits in a little sandwich baggie. <laughs> so that's how small it was. <laughs> oh, wow. But we now lovingly refer to that bikini as the patriotic band-aid because she was like, this is as small as a band-aid. I have never seen you wear anything like this. <laughs> yeah, I've interviewed several Miss Americas and um, they say something similar that they mm-hmm. have felt empowered by the um, lifestyle and fitness category. I don't know whether it'll ever come back. Um, most people think it won't, but some people are wondering, um, is there a way to bring it back? Um you know, without the women being judged by it, or I don't know, some kind yeah. of compromise. So yeah. we're kind of. It is. It's an interesting debate because all things have to evolve in time, right? Mm-hmm. If we stay the same, we die. Yeah. I mean, that that is history, right? If we don't learn from history, if we don't evolve with um, the necessary a flow of uh, society and, and evolving into mm-hmm. better people, then uh, we don't get better as a people, right? Right. And the Miss America organization though, has been such a driving force for the advancement of women Mm -hmm. for nearly a hundred years. I mean, it's really spectacular. When you look back at Miss America history, I'm a huge history buff. I love looking at history, um, which is probably why I love opera as well. Why I love classical music. Uh That's a, a component of it. But when we look back at the scope of how Miss America has been at the forefront of giving women opportunity throughout those 100 years, mm-hmm. um, it, we can also see that there were changes that happened right. in order to allow greater opportunity for women throughout those years. Mm-hmm. The platform issue being one of those, right? Yeah. When the Miss America organization witnessed um, the effect that Kehlani Ray Rothko was having on the, the American public because she was speaking out about uh, her career, mm-hmm. about an issue that was of particular concern to her, that changed the fabric of what those of us to come would be uh, able to do as Miss Americas. And it legitimized our experiences. Mm -hmm. And then you think back to the addition of scholarship dollars, right? Mm -hmm. By Lenora Slaughter, who saw that the women going through the program were so much more than their swimwear. Right. And Yolande Betbees, who basically said, I don't want to be crowned in a swimsuit. I don't want to be seen in a swimsuit right, anymore. Right. I want to be seen as me. So the program has to evolve, but it is so hard yeah. to see these staples of what we love about the program um, go away. So I'm definitely in that camp of, I wish that there was a compromise. Yeah. I, I don't, when I, I'll tell you this, I judged the Miss Washington pageant mm-hmm. um, that year that swimwear was um, was taken out. Right. But at the state level, the contestants were still competing in swimwear right. because that was what was scheduled. Yeah. And it was beautiful to see these young women compete in swimwear in with the knowledge of knowing that it wasn't really going to have any bearing on yeah. who was going to be crowned, but they still wanted to do it anyway mm-hmm. because it was empowering. And so I wish there's a way, uh, there was more of a way for us to communicate that. Uh, a, to the public, you know, there's always misconceptions and stereotypes surrounding that. Yeah. Um, I feel like Miss America, the Miss America organization has made so uh, many strides for the women's empowerment movement. It's, it's, um, it's all about us making sure to communicate that to the mm-hmm. public though. And I feel like this is an opportunity to do so. Right. I'm scheduled to interview um, Chantel Krebs, the chairman Ooh, and interim yes. CEO of Miss America mm-hmm. in January. So, um, Great. you know, I'll try to mention that to her that some people want like a, a little compromise. So um, do you keep in touch with your Miss America sisters? Um, oh, do you come to the yes. pageant often? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, there have been a couple of pageants that I have missed. Um, I will distinctly remember in 2009, I had a one week old baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, my daughter was one week old. And this was when the pageant was moved to January. Mm-hmm. 
and um, my daughter was crowned, uh, or excuse me, my daughter was crowned, my daughter was born on January 9th okay. of that year. So there was no traveling for me, but right. I do remember watching the pageant with her in my arms and just being so proud to do so that the that my daughter would grow up to know this program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have had to miss from two different shows that I was in that happened during the Miss America pageant. So I was on stage performing oh, at see. that time. Right. Um, and those are the only ones that I've missed. So I've missed three total in, what is it, almost 20 years. This is my 19th year. Very cool. Yeah, I saw that you had a lot of pictures with your Miss America sisters. Oh, yes. Um, I treasure that sisterhood. Amazing. You know, Jason, it's very, very important to me that the stories of women are very important to me. It always has been. But uh, my friendships, in addition to my family and my faith, that is what I treasure. Those are gifts in life. And the sisterhood is a gift. Mm -hmm. I treasure these women. We um, have regular conversations outside of anything to do with pageants. Oh, right. my dear sweet Leanza. Yeah. Um, and we are a part of the fabric of each other's lives. It's such a joy. I, I now get to teach voice lessons to Ava Johnson, Nicole Johnson's daughter. Oh, cool. And to Tatum Shepard, who's oh, Kelly Cash's wow. daughter. Oh, yeah. And we, in what you saw in some of those photos, we get together regularly yeah. to to see each other, to right. be a part of each other's lives. Last year, we had the distinct privilege of appearing with uh, Pink Martini, the Grammy Award winning band, um, at the Hollywood Bowl. And we sang Helen Reddy's famous I Am Woman. And to be next to, there were 18 of us Miss Americas, mm -hmm. to be together standing together singing those famous words as a sisterhood right there is truly nothing more empowering than that yeah. <laughs> it was a really special moment that we all yeah. treasure and speaking of leanza i i definitely want to remember her and i'm, I'm so yes. blessed and happy that i got i was able to interview her and she did tell me the same things like how you guys get together and and just the amazing time that you guys have together extremely um, special yeah and she I, was special yeah. oh what a light i mean that laugh her zest yeah. her joy was effervescent and, and it was really evident in everything she did and everything she said truly yeah. and that was so inspiring i will never forget um my very first professional opera gig was uh with the gold coast opera in fort lauderdale florida mm -hmm. and at the time lianza um she had just had her second baby okay and she met up with me um she wasn't able to come and see the show but she met up with me during i think it was one of our dress rehearsal times and we sat and while she had that sweet baby on her lap i, I have pictures of that that i look look at now and i just treasure it but while she was being this incredible mother um she just poured forth all this wisdom onto me. Oh, she wow. was so loving. She was so caring. Um, that was my Leanne's a fangirl moment. Yeah. Because I hadn't, I didn't have the chance to meet her during, um, mm -hmm. during that year. So this was, I think a year and a half after I was Miss America that I was privileged to meet her for the first time. Right. And she made such an indelible impression on me and really showed me what, um, what a former Miss America was. Right. right. Yeah. Not just a Miss America, but a, what is a former Miss America? Mm -hmm. I just remember her being so genuine and service oriented. Oh, That's yeah. what I'll take from it. Um, I don't want to take up much more of your time. So I think I'll just ask you maybe one or one more question. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give girls who are competing today? Girls who want the crown, um, maybe even after they get it. What advice would um, you give, you know, candidates who are competing for the title of Miss America? Absolutely. Um, the advice that I give to title holders, uh, contestants, anyone pursuing the program mm -hmm. is to know thyself. And that being use this opportunity to really understand a who you are, who mm -hmm. you've been created to be, right. who you're made to be, um, what you can and can't do, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and then B learn 
how you can make an impact in this program beyond the title. When someone knows that you're a part of this program, they're automatically going to categorize you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know the ins and outs of your, of what you bring to the world, um, you will be lost for kind of wandering around other people's opinions of you. And you will stray farther and farther and farther from who you truly, truly are. Wow. This, uh, any, any kind of entertainment profession has the ability to do that, mm -hmm. to cause you to lose sight of yourself because you're getting lots of feedback from people telling you who you should be. Yeah. But the whole point and purpose of being part of a program like this is to, to be able to use the advancement opportunities that you're given to make an impact in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Through your education, through your talent, through your, your service. Um, so if you don't truly, truly know who you are authentically, um, other people will not be able to see the true you in what you're trying to do and say. Right. Uh, authenticity is extremely important in mm -hmm. our world. Right. And it's very hard to figure out what that is. What is authenticity, right? What am I, who, who am I? What am I supposed to be? Yeah. Well, if you are, are being kind, if you are being grateful, if you are truly appreciating all of the ways that people in this program like you, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jason, Thanks. are investing in them in order for their advancement. Right. You will find who you truly are. It will be, um, it will be as evident as the nose on your face, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to, to find that. You have to be willing to accept it. Right, and lastly, um, you, you're still performing today, is that correct? And I, I think am. you wrote a book. Do you wanna tell the fans really quickly, you know, about- well, that book that I wrote uh -huh. was with my competition sisters during my year as Miss America. Cool. That is about our experience uh, serving in the wake of 9-11. And it details exactly what I told you. And, oh but it's goodness. from all of our perspective. That's never happened before. All 51 of us got together and contributed essays of what it was like to A, compete during that year and B, serve during such an amazing year. And in terms of, of what I do today, absolutely. You'll find me on stages throughout the world. I just uh, co-founded uh, the Virtuosa Society with my dear friend and creative partner, Christine Eggert. Christine is a Canadian pianist who now lives in Denmark. Mm -hmm. She and I met um, when I was doing my graduate work in vocal performance. And we quickly discovered that many of our academic resources did not include any works by women. Oh, okay. We, uh, from that point, and, and one of my master's recitals was actually tailored to try to find the the female voice in classical music and in, in opera and in classical music so we're talking uh the voice of women as written by women composers and over the past three years christine and i have done uh, a vast uh, we call it an archaeological dig mm -hmm. <laughs> into a female composed music from all genres. We started in classical music and then uh, we're so inspired to broaden into other genres. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided that now was the time where we want to advocate for greater programming of female composers and, mm -hmm. and female written works in um, major symphony and operatic programming, but also we have a, a classical, or not just classical, I should say, but a concert series now where we're touring, touring the world, uh, performing these incredible works. And very, we very first, cool. Yes, we were inspired to do this because one of our founding female composers, um, Francesca Caccini, Mm -hmm. composed during the plague, the Italian plague of 1630, where she was quarantined for three years with her two children. And she wrote some of the most uh, magnificent works in music history. If Francesca can, can do it, we can get through this time in our history right now. So I'm very excited by this passion project and I continue, we'll be continuing to do operatic performance. I'm mm -hmm. slated to be in Prague next June 
uh, for more opera and uh, very, very excited that hopefully the world of performance opens back up so that we can get back on stage again. But very, very cool. Well, I'm going to check out that book. And if I'm ever in your area, I will definitely try to see you on stage. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on my show. I really, really, really enjoyed talking to you. If you don't mind, you can stay on um, and I'm going to finish, wrap it up with the audience. And then um, I'll talk to you after the show. I would love that. Thank so you, thanks again for being on the show. Um, to the viewers, I want to thank you so much for watching the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if anybody would like to donate to the show, you can donate to my cash app. It's dollar sign J-T-R-O-B-I-N. Or you can donate to my GoFundMe. Just look me up on Facebook in the pageant chat group. You can email me at JasonTimothyRobinson at gmail.com. But I hope you keep watching. And uh, once again, thanks again and have a good day.